Great. Okay, it's six o'clock, so it's time um, for uh, our next community stream with the MIT Enterprise Forum. Uh, this is the September 17th edition, uh, 2020. So welcome everybody. It's good to see you, quote unquote, again. Um, and we are very excited today to have a conversation with Michael Schrake, who's here with us. Um, Michael's a research fellow at the MIT Sloan School of Management um, at the Initiative on the Digital Economy. And he's a sought after expert on innovation, metrics, and network effects, and the author of several books, including Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? The Innovator's Hypothesis, How Cheap Experiments Are Worth More Than Good Ideas, and his newest book, Recommendation Engines, which uh, we might focus on a little bit today. So um, welcome, Thank Michael. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. my expectation, yes. Yeah, yeah. We, um, my household just finished reading it, and it was excellent. Um, and so thank you for the copy, I forgot to say, and congratulations on the latest <laughs> Yeah. So welcome, Michael. Welcome, everybody. You know, as always, we're going to keep things pretty casual. Um, and this will definitely be more of a Q&A session. And as always, towards the end, we will welcome any audience questions. So let's get it kicked off. Um, but I think uh, we are going to dive into the recommendation engine part of this first, actually. So we'll start most recent first, and then maybe go backwards, Michael, but feel free to, um, you know, keep it casual. So, you know, maybe we'll jump off with a question on what do people misunderstand about recommendation engines first, and then, you know, we'll see where that takes us. So, so what do you think? <laughs> I like that question for two reasons. Number one, it's a way of getting into recommendation engines. Recommendation engines, whoops. Yeah, whoops. Yeah. Well, it's not coming through. Well, so much for that. But the other is, is that it's partly a trick question because mm -hmm. I think that pe what people misunderstand about recommendation engines is what makes them work mm -hmm. or not work and how intimate they are. Yeah. And the reality is, to my mind, the single most important thing that's been going on in recommendation engines and what people don't really understand is that right now, recommendation engines are probably the most sophisticated, scaled application of machine learning and deep learning around. Yeah. You look at TikTok, mm -hmm. which has become a hot global trade yeah. issue, a privacy issue. And, you know, people think that TikTok is a video or pop culture thing. TikTok is a recommendation engine company. You've heard of the phrase born digital. TikTok was born recommender. Mm -hmm. So what we have now increasingly is the application of deep learning and machine learning so that recommendation engines learn about you. They learn about you. And this is, you know, the phrase that I spent a lot of time on unpacking in the book is the, the, the Japanese perception, the Chinese perception, the American perception, and the Swedish perception because of Spotify is these, what? companies want the recommendation engine to know more about you than you know about yourself. Right. Spotify wants to know more about your musical taste. Yeah. Uh, TikTok wants to understand what you're going to produce and share. Amazon wants to know what you're going to buy and or read. Um, LinkedIn wants to know about what kind of a job or project or connection you want to make. They want to anticipate and proactively deliver advice and recommendations. And I don't think people fully understand that that is really what the technology is being used for. Right. Um, and it's, I, I think that's a key issue. And what does the future of personalization mean when software knows more about how you like to exercise choice than you do? And I hope that's a question we're going to spend more time discussing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for that um, to kick us off. And, you know, I think, I think you mentioned actually towards the latter half of the book, maybe that phrase in particular, you know, coming up with software that knows you better than yourself. Right. And that thought really stuck with me because 
to be quite honest, I think at first I was definitely creeped out thinking about, you know, uh, something out there that uh, presumably, you know, I know myself the best. I hope, I should hope, but um, I also- You should discuss that with your husband. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we'll see who knows me better. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, then you, I think there's a, a concept uh, you also talk about where maybe it's a, a tool or, or some sort of, um, way to also self-reflect and, and hold up a mirror and see what your preferences are perhaps so you've you've hit on the most important thing that i discovered mm -hmm. in writing the book mm -hmm. and this was not a subject i was quote unquote an expert on but to me it represented an interesting confluence and convergence of many of the areas i was doing research on you had mentioned that i've done a lot of work on network effects well the recommendation engines are indeed the best ones are the products of network effects personalization network effects that's a that's a happy zone a happy convergence <clears throat> the big insight the big discovery in the course of writing the book was that I realized that recommendation engines weren't just about providing you with great recommendations or great advice as the software got to know you better than you knew yourself. It was about self-discovery. Mm -hmm. Recommendations really, as much by default as by design, are about what what do you, what are you really interested in? If, yeah. if the data suggests that these are the best recommendations, why the heck are you ignoring them? One of the intriguing things to me is sometimes the recommendation engine is going to give you better advice or better recommendations than your spouse, your significant other, your family, people who've known you for years because they have different quote unquote motivations. So I really believe that, that when you are surrounded by recommendations in music, I, I, you know, I left out Netflix as an example, in, in, in video, in science research, what is it, why are they making these recommendations? What is it about you that yeah. makes these algorithms think mm -hmm. you'll be interested? you'll swipe left or swipe right. I, sh I should have included uh, match.com and Tinder, I suppose, but but we're both married, so we'll skip the those. Although, by the way, the algorithms, for, the matching algorithms are very, very interesting because yeah. one of the best lines, just to quickly digress, is, you know, it's one thing if, if you like a Netflix movie, but the Netflix movie doesn't have to like you back. So the notion of designing a matching algorithm for dating functions is, 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 is rather different. But again, what is, what is a greater cause for introspection than being introduced to a certain kind of significant yeah. other as a potential mate or date or hookup? And why? Why? So the, the whole notion of the future of introspection, the future of self-discovery, struck me as the most important for me personal takeaway yeah. in all of this. Yeah. And I don't mean this, forgive me for going on a bit, bit longer, I don't mean this in a narcissistic way. I really mean it in a way that, that if you really want to develop as a person, if you really want to connect with yourself as well as with other people, shouldn't you be looking to technologies that give you rational, rational, reasonable, and plausible insight yeah. into good advice, recommendations that matter to you. I, so I was blown away the more I paid attention to it, to the notion of the future of self and the future of agency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's, uh, to be quite frank, very profound because, you know, uh -oh. when. <laughs> when you mention TikTok, immediately my mind goes to, you know, some social media app of videos that I'm too old to understand. Like that's my definition of TikTok. Um, but I think it's, I think that's actually a really fascinating angle to it because when I, uh, you know, being a little bit of a Luddite myself, when I think about technology sometimes, uh, my conclusion may be outdated is that it actually gives you all these distractions right like it's sort yes. of it's like an outlet where you can you can you know watch a video or you know talk to somebody or scroll through some pictures and be mindless yeah be mindless. Exactly. 
Exactly. And what is that actually doing for you? So I think this perspective of, you know, that aiding your self-development and interest. No, actually, I love how you're putting that because, you know, there's this famous line from the economist uh, uh, Kenneth Boulding, which I love and I've used frequently, is that he said that you can divide the world into two groups of people, those who divide the world into two groups of people and those who don't. And what you've identified is a very interesting demarcation because for many people, social media and the internet, it's a way to become mindless. Right. You know, right. Recommendation engines, even TikTok, yeah. can, if, if, you, if you have a healthy relationship, yeah. it can become a medium, a mechanism, a platform to become more mindful, okay. more intentional, yeah. more self-aware. Yes, it is true that TikTok is designed explicitly in some dimensions to, to become addictive, that you default to the next one, yeah. you know, that you, but, but at a certain point, you're going to begin to ask yourself, why? I mean, I, I, maybe people don't ask themselves, but at a certain point, you have to ask, why these videos? Yeah. Why this dance move? Why this music? Yeah. Should yeah. I explore alternatives? And, and, and once you begin asking yourself, once you become more mindful and intentional, because there's a reason why you're being shown those videos, there's a reason why you're hearing that music, there's a reason why you're being introduced to these people on, at, on Facebook or, or on Instagram, um, the moment you begin to become more intentional, yeah. that's a real journey of self-discovery. Yeah. And, and here's the trick, the trick is, the algorithms had better be smart enough to recognize not, oh, this person wants more of the same, right. that there needs to be different kinds of novelty, yeah. serendipity, yeah. relevance, yeah. discovery. Those are the axes of innovation for recommendation systems that endure. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that's another great point is that, you know, just the, the monotony or whatever you want to call it of being recommended the same yes. thing over and over again is not going to do anything or keep anyone's interest right so where is that like slight differentiation or what 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 makes that relationship um from the previous thing that you clicked on to the next thing like close enough right <laughs> that it's gonna... but, 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 but look at what you're saying now now i'll do the the truly creepy thing okay. the truly creepy thing is we have this with quote unquote our friends and our family at a certain point you know we can predict how our significant other or our friend or our sibling or our parent is what we know what they're going to say. Right. You know, right. And, and at a certain level, we become complacent or dare I use your word mindless uh -huh. Uh -huh. In, in our dealing with them. And so it's going to be interesting to see whether to connect the two dots here, yeah. does a recommendation engine that knows you better than you know yourself become more exciting more provocative more intriguing more interesting than a friend for 15 20 years who let's be blunt you've become a little the inertia has sort of taken over yeah. on this you've become complacent right. recommendation engines that become complacent get abandoned yeah. they fail so there's sort of a market mechanism aspect here. And I'm very intrigued by that. And, and I have to say, I think we're just at the beginning of the co-evolution of the self and the recommendation system that learns you better than you know yourself. I think that's one of the most fascinating trajectories in the history of technology and in the history of people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think I, I can, you know, even within my lifetime and within the last 10 years of my lifetime, probably, I remember when uh, the, maybe the beginning of the beginning, when these kinds of mechanisms were being rolled out. And I, I always remember thinking they were not very good, actually. Like, you know, right. the Amazon, you know, if you like this, you should buy this. And it was never anything I was interested in. And now... This old style, you know, yeah. there was people like you, there was even K-means clusters, item to item similarities. People like you, what are the dimensions of that? And yeah. they were perfectly, you know, those content recommenders, those collaborative filter recommenders and the hybrids, perfectly good. Yeah. But what happens when, I mean, what was one of the real revolutions of something that I spend a lot of time in the book discussing the Netflix prize from over a decade ago? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it used to, Netflix used to encourage you, as did, as did, by the way, Facebook, you would do certain 
ratings, explicit right. ratings. But what did we discover? What did the Netflix Prize app in the wake of the Netflix Prize, et cetera, what did we discover? We discovered that implicit behaviors matter more than and have greater predictive validity than explicit ratings. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, what you do matters way more than what you say in terms of recommendation right, right. and in terms of advice. Mm -hmm. And this is key. So we can all say that, oh, I, I really look forward to this documentary on the future of sustainability right. because, you know, the survival of planet Earth is key. Well, and, you know, MIT, Men's and Women's, we have a special obligation to be up to date on how to preserve the environment, particularly with wildfires on the Pacific Northwest and California. Oh, the carbon emissions. But the reality is, you know, we're waiting for the next season of Mrs. Maisel to drop. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so that's going to be one of the other aspects of introspection. What happens when you audit these recommendations yeah. And you discover who you really are, right. as right. opposed to how you would like to project yourself. Yes, exactly. And I think, um, yeah, really salient point, because as, as we've talked about, I, I work in data and analytics, and yeah. I would love to know, actually, what my own sort of data set looks like in that regard. But I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, having worked in psych and social service, social sciences, I should say myself, you know, there's this idea of... Um, social desirability, you know, that's always a thing. Like even on surveys or if you ask somebody a question to self-report on any matter, they're not gonna exactly tell you the truth, right? They might not lie, but they might not, you know, actually reflect the real ground truth. Now you're getting to the great ethical question. I have here an aura ring uh, on my finger. That, what's, yeah. more, what's more believable, my quantified self exercise sleep right. behavior? Or yeah. the the twenty question questionnaire the the ER or the doctor's office gives me to answer in this right. room. Right. I think that's pretty clear. Right. But actually, I want to go because we did have the opportunity to talk before. Yeah. I do want to go into some aspect of your your background and tie it into the recommendation book because you work in in healthcare and in yeah. medicine. Yeah. And you know, to me, one of the and I don't like using this word, but I'll use it in this context. Mm -hmm. One of the paradigm shifting things about recommendation yep. is that it defied what I can. They defied what I would call the original sin of analytics. Okay. What is the original sin of analytics. What's the objective function? How do we optimize it? How do we optimize things? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Like the healthcare, and you know, what's the best treatment mm -hmm. for my condition? What is the thing mm -hmm. that the doctor should do or the healthcare system should do for yeah. me? Yeah. And recommendation systems are explicitly designed to defy mm -hmm. that optimization aspiration. Yeah. The issue is not what's the best choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The issue is what are the best choices? Show me the distribution of choices, not the optimal choice, the distribution. Right. And so you're literally forcing people or asking people, if you're yeah. nice, to make a choice between what should be reasonable, plausible, actionable options, whether it's somebody you go out with, whether it's a book to read, whether it's a video to view, whether it's a song to hear, whether it's a restaurant to yeah. order from or, or, or visit. Mm -hmm. So recommendation engines aren't about what's the best answer. Right. Recommendation engines are about what are the best choices mm -hmm. and the, the autonomy, the yeah. agency, the responsibility goes back to you. Right. And there's something wrong it's a signal amidst the noise. There's something wrong if you look at a bunch of choices from a recommender and none of them appeal to you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. That's the non-barking dog. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. So I would argue, you know, I talk about this co-evolution of people and technology going forward. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most important challenges going forward is what does choice look like? in an era of greater right. what are What are the choice yeah. architectures that don't just influence, but empower 
and inspire. Yeah. Who is going to win that battle? I want to come away from that meeting in the doctor's office, not quote, trusting. I mean, by the way, just to make a second, uh, just to make a, a meaningful digression, one of the greatest innovations in the history of 20th century medicine was the second opinion, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, is sort of a default recommendation. In sure. you know, what are, what are, what you know, is am I getting affirmation or right. you know what's the variance here? Right, right. Okay. So speaking for me, and, and this is a motivation for writing the book. I I do not like being told what to do. My parents will will vouch for that. My wife will vouch for that. Every single teacher I had in school will vouch for that. I'm self-employed largely outside of MIT. So, you know, my former employers would have would have told you that too. I don't like being told what to do. On the other hand, I love you if you give me good choices. I, so, so the whole issue I think going forward is what does it mean to give people good choices? I, I think that's a revolution. I think that's a revolution. Yeah, yeah. And I think that how we architect more good choices I think that's the future of work. Yeah. And I think that's the future of interpersonal relationships. Yeah, yeah. and I was, I was struck too by, and you mentioned, um, I think Cass and Sunstein and uh, you know, various behavioral economists. And yeah. that was- Richard Taylor and Cass Sunstein who wrote yeah. Nudge. Right. Absolutely terrific, terrific work and inspiration. And yes, I did do a, a, a chapter based on, on choice architectures and the irony, forgive me for saying this, they wrote about Nudge and it's like recommendation engines didn't even exist for them. But now that work in choice architectures literally inspires people all yeah. over the world, yeah. all over the world. Yeah, I was, uh, I was introduced to it when I was doing my master's or just the, the field itself. And I was definitely, um, you know, I, I'm pretty, I like to, I like my data and I like to know what the numbers are, but it is mind boggling to think that just a little, you know, nudge or just a little right. clear or a little, you know, a different, you know, height for your groceries or whatever, you know, putting something in your line of sight can like create some crazy outcome that is so different, you know, and so, so much better. Not a, not a crazy outcome. My colleague at MIT who went to Duke, uh, uh, Dan Ariely wrote the book, yeah. Predictably yeah. Irrational. Yeah. Predictably yeah. Irrational, you know, is the opposite side of the same coin as a, as a choice architecture. Yeah. But it's the same thing with the, the, the back to the medical Thing. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to be told this is the best treatment. It's another thing to be said, here are your best options and why. Right. And right. I think that's a real schism yeah. for culture in the West yeah. and in the East, all over the world. What is the expectation over the next, for, for everybody on this call, everybody yeah. on this webinar, is the expectation going forward is how will choices be presented to us? Why those choices? Right, right, right. right. Whose interest? Is, yeah. is it Amazon because they're trying to sell something or because they know we'll be inspired by this kind of book yeah. or this kind of bundling? Yeah, yeah. That's, my gosh, yeah. enormous. Right. Yeah, that is. And speaking of, you know, sort of, uh, you talk a little bit about agency, free will, like these sorts of things. I mean, I definitely had a question reading the book about, you know, like you're saying, if you're constraining or somebody, some third party outside of yourself is constraining the number of options that you have, right? Like, I think a lot of humans like to think that things are limitless or, you know, the world is your oyster or whatever, you know, but if they're, your choices themselves are constrained and sort of presented to you in a nice like matrix, like here's five things, which one right. do you want? Is it uh, ethical or, you know, like you're constraining your universe of options, no? I I love that question for a variety of reasons. Okay. And I play with this idea as sort of a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, mm -hmm. which, is, which is, I would like to see tunable recommenders. Okay. okay? Yep. And you know, we can talk about the interfaces and I'll come up with a good example in, one, in, in, in a moment, which is conservatively a $10 billion example. <laughs> you know, I would like to say, well, What's the next choice? Do we do the yeah. same, the next page of search on Google yeah. or Baidu? What's the next page or other, you know, dig deeper for, for, you know, 
uh, uh, we'll say Amazon, people like you, and then I say people like you in a good mood. Right, right. But people like you who are really curious. Right. So is there another attribute or aspect that we could layer in to, to reframe right. or refilter the choice? Mm -hmm. Here's the $10 billion suggestion idea, which I know Amazon is seriously working on, so yeah. I will never see a, a portion of that. But I would wager, because this is an MIT crowd, a non-trivial portion of people. Do you have an Alexa at home? I, you can I, do. I do, and yet it's sitting in a box, not being used, yeah. <laughs> my, my wife unplugged it after she found out that it was listening to you all the time. So yes, that, yes. But, yeah. But let's just say that Alexa, let's assume for the sake of argument that Alexa is a very successful product and interface. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Suppose you say to Alexa, Alexa, play me a sad song. Mm -hmm. What's it worth if Alexa can say, how sad are you? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, Alexa, I would like Chinese food. Yeah. Would you like wontons? Yeah. What happens, and I'm picking this because of the voice interface, not just the visual interface. Yeah. What happens when a dialogue mm -hmm. can play a role in framing those expectations? Right. I want non-spicy, we're back to learning more about you. Right. Do you want Alexa proactively, not just answering, but we can't do that, but how about this? Right, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to say this without any fear at all. Mm -hmm. That's not science fiction, that's beta text. That's in beta, you know it's in beta. Yeah. You look at what's going on yeah. and the ability to come in with an Amazon skill for certain kinds of interactions, that's not going to be all that challenging. Right. And that's going to be the way we engage around choice. So you're absolutely right. Who gets to put constraints on the choice? Mm -hmm. Okay, how do we empower the user mm -hmm. to challenge, flex, mm -hmm. or loosen those constraints, or even redefine right. those constraints? Right. Right. I, uh, I want to read uh, uh, Spotify. I only want to hear happy songs, none of which last more than three minutes. <laughs> Spotify will deliver you that kind of a playlist, ultimately. You can try. So, so is that a good idea? I don't know. But yeah. it goes back to what we've been discussing this entire conversation. Who are you? Right. How do you discover who you are? Right. I think one of the best ways to discover who you are is to get advice and recommendations from people who know you well, and in the 21st century, technologies that know you well. Yes, yeah, because they, they even better than the people. I, yeah, I was gonna say at this point, they may have more you know, hard data on you than, uh, than your, your mom or your sister or <laughs> anyone else, so uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. wouldn't that be a great ethical issue? Who yeah. do you trust for? Here, here's an ethical issue that everybody lives with right now. Mm -hmm. Who do you trust for, with apologies to COVID, a, rec a restaurant recommendation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Your friends, yeah. your recommender systems. Yeah. Who do you trust for a book recommendation? Right, right. right. Who do you trust? I, right now in my circle, more people trust Spotify. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, the whole notion of, should you make your Spotify playlist? How public should it be? How shareable should it be? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think now that I think about it, that would be a good matchup for Match.com. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they can uh, collaborate with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I was going to ask actually. Um, you mentioned you start actually with the history of sort of um, recommendations, let's say, without the tech part. And what, in your opinion, constitutes good advice? Do you think? Because that's a that's a hard question. No. <laughs> um. Well, it's funny, I, I, before I answer that question, I want to point out, you mentioned that I do a, an entire chapter on the yeah. history of advice. Yeah, yeah. One of the, one of, it's MI, the book is from MIT Press. Mm -hmm. um, not one, but two of the academic reviewers wanted that chapter cut. Oh, Because really? it wasn't about recommendation. And my view was like, are you crazy? 
Recommendation is something that transcends history and culture. The I Ching, yeah. astrology, it was, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So what constitutes good advice? I have, writing this book forced me to revisit that and you know, look at what, what's the advice I've taken that was good advice? What's the advice I've ignored that was good advice? But good advice is something, I mean, I'll, I'll give the quasi-physics answer, you resonate with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the key thing is you see a good part of yourself mm -hmm. in advice. Mm -hmm. You see a good future for yourself okay. in that advice. You yeah. should really consider doing that. Yes, that appeals to me. I see myself right. in right. that. Right. And here's what's so interesting at least I think it's interesting, psychologically and sociologically, you can get very good advice from, from people and objectively it's good advice, but you don't see yourself in it. You right. don't see that right for you. Right, right. And I think it's at that point you have to ask yourself, why, mm -hmm. why? For a recommender, clearly they've got the data. For yeah. a friend, does your friend misunderstand you? misunderstand the situation? Did you not adequately ask for or elicit or solicit the advice? So again, we're back to the notion of what I'm calling the next AI. Yeah. Augmented introspection. Okay. How do we use technology to get a better understanding of ourselves? Yeah. I think good advice, it, what makes good advice is you discover something about who you are and what you want to do. Yes, I do want to try this new place. Yeah. Yes, I do want to take this person over here. Right, right, right. That you wouldn't have otherwise yeah. considered. Yeah. And that's what distinguishes good advice from advice to bad advice. Right, right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, they could have called them in all seriousness. They could have called it advice engines. Yeah. You know? But right. the one thing they didn't do was call them compliance engines right. or adherence engines or buy this or else yeah. in yeah. you know so the whole notion of choice yeah. is embedded in there it's right. embedded in the architecture right. and that's a big deal yeah 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 um uh we actually have some questions from the audience fantastic right? yeah um and we i like yours by the way so I'm <laughs> Thank you. Um, got them from a good source. Uh, but uh, I think um, we can jump, you know, in and out of these things as they, as wherever they leave us. But the first one we have is you mentioned the concept of serendipity, which yeah. you in the book as predictable surprise or providing yeah. recommendations that users like but wouldn't have expected. Can you go into more detail about the role of serendipity in recommendation engines and how it's implemented in practice? Okay. Yeah, I think we, we started talking about that a little bit. Yeah. Yes, um, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, serendipity, there's the famous uh, essay by, by uh, uh, Robert Merton on the Prince, you know, Prince, uh, the, the, the Prince of Serendip. Um, you know, it's a happy discovery. Mm -hmm. um, serendipity is about, well, let me step back because I want to put it in a probabilistic mode. Okay. Now, serendipity is you, you roll, you're, you're rolling dice and you get numbers, lucky seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. For recommendation engines, they're trying to load the dice, mm -hmm. load the probabilistic, statistical, stochastic dice so that you get something that's at the edge of relevance and diversity. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it's the intersection there that you're surprised yeah. and it's a happy surprise right. on this because serendipity, if, if it's just another flavor of ice cream, you know, it's, it's, it's like ice cream with, gosh, you know, what would be serendipity? I, mean, I haven't eaten ice cream recently on this, but <laughs> is you, you, you discover um, calorie free ice cream or ice cream that can go, um, you know, let's 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 do the the molecular gastronomy thing. Okay. You know, uh, uh, ice cream, which is a flavor that you would never have associated right. with, with 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 it, and so it pops up. You think that you're getting you're interested in ice cream, but this pops up. You don't have remember 
you don't have to do it. It's but it's there as a recommendation. You said, my gosh, I would never have thought that ice cream would come in, you know, peanut butter or or I can't say something like meat or fish because that will put people off for 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 dinner. Savory ice cream, yeah. <laughs> but, but this is the thing. This is what this is where the mathematics become so interesting, which is where on the surface space, mm -hmm. where in the dimensionality, what what clusters, what th what outliers, because it has to be on the envelope. It has to be, it intersect with a couple of the relevant things. You know, what qualifies as serendipitous? Now, mind you, pun intended, these deep learning things, they're mindless. This is all about feature selection and feature extraction, but there is some latent feature or bundle of latent features that converge and can be found at the intersection here. And that's the nature of, of, of serendipity. Because let's be blunt, serendipity is about luck. Everybody listening in knows the Zen koan, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. You know, that you have to be ready to appreciate that this is serendipitous, that that the the uh, um, you, you do a, 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 a search. I mean, let me, let me give you a, a, a specific recommendation I made. It was turned down by LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, um, no, no, no. I'm, I'm being quite serious here. Okay. This was, a, I thought, you know, as you might imagine, when you think about these things, you think about interesting mashups. Yeah, yeah. And my suggestion was that LinkedIn and G, Google and Gmail should agree on, and this was before before um, uh, Microsoft bought LinkedIn. So just just to date myself on this, <laughs> but when you do a Google search, yeah. people in your LinkedIn profile who might have some expertise in this would turn up in the search either in the search or off on the side, co-branded. Yeah, you you get that. You yeah. don't have to call them, but oh my gosh, I do know somebody who knows something about this, and. That's the sort of way you quote unquote load the dice yeah. for serendipity. You create these mashups of what? Data, data frameworks, data architectures, ontologies, metadata that increase your chances for serendipitous slash lucky, yeah. albeit understandably rationally lucky right. outcomes. Yeah, and I think that's going to be one of the most interesting things. So, so when this this person asks about serendipity, th those are the dimensions along which I think about about serendipity. What kind of things can you mash together that improve your chances of being lucky right, and right. of being ready to do it, yeah. ready to be lucky? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, and yeah, I think that's very key. Is like both being. Uh, pleasantly surprised, but also receptive to it at the same time. Those are, that's a hard that's, and, and And by the way, learning how receptive you are is introspection. Mm -hmm. Why am I so resistant yeah. to these yeah. kinds of recommendations and advice versus those kinds of recommendations and advice? Insight into the nature of resistance is every bit as valuable as insight into the nature of openness and acceptance. And recommended recommender systems, to my mind, represent one of the most intriguing diagnostics for that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm really Long -winded answer, sorry. No, I'm, I'm enjoying this. Uh, I, I don't know, I feel like my mind has been changed on how you know technology is used and recommendation engines in general. I, I definitely had a very uh, unilateral view or whatever, one dimensional view of it. So I, I enjoy when it's, uh, you're doing a mashup here of, you know, technology. That, that's exactly, but let me, let me go with one more suggestion. I, I came up with that, that went nowhere. Um, and, and I think this is a hundred billion dollar. Yeah. Issue. I would have liked it. <laughs> well, how can we get, and with apologies to your, to your spouse, you know, how could a recommendation engine improve the quality of the gifts he gives you. Oh, okay. Because even though he knows you and loves you, there's certain things he may be, shall we say, just oblivious. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, so without, you know, so I, I don't want to do any privacy violation, but wouldn't it be neat if by having access to certain kinds of 
right. data around you, implicit and explicit. He could work with a recommender, you know, the the semi the semi recommender, you know, <laughs> and and you know dramatically. And again, it's his choice. Yeah. You know, yeah. And maybe he can test out some of the recommendations to see which ones you, you know, implicitly or explicitly like more. But so it's not just about recommendation for introspection. It's about recommendation for insight into relationships as well. Yeah. I like God, knows, God knows it would work with my spouse. Yeah, I was going to say, I think a lot of spouses would enjoy that idea. And it, it's not just a uh, and it's not just for one person, for both, you know, that's, uh, it's hard sometimes <laughs> to get people. Oh, serious point from the book. Yeah. yeah. One of the biggest challenges Netflix has mm -hmm. is coming up with recommendations for couples uh, um, based on mutual playlists uh, and families yeah. with yeah. certain ages. Yeah. You can imagine that learning what a family likes is not the same as learning what dad likes or learning what mom likes or what mom and dad like. The that Venn diagram doesn't work. Yeah. So, so how, if you're Netflix, mm -hmm. do you develop a recommendation yeah. ecosystem yeah. that recognizes yeah. and acknowledges family viewing yeah. as opposed to binge watching for you? Right, right, right. And the, the, these are the machine learning, AI, deep learning questions for the next 10 years. Yeah, that's fascinating, actually. Yeah, because it just, I feel like it'll become exponentially harder. Not even, it's not linear, right? It's like a... Exactly. It's a combinatorial explosion. And given the work that you with drugs, it's like, you know, what's what, what happens when you are a combinatorial number of preferences? Yeah. Do you go for the lowest common denominator? Where are you prepared to push the envelope? Right, right, right. So... So I, I think it would be interesting to see how many recommend who cuties is being recommended to for couples. Uh -huh. Just just kidding for the for the contemporaneous aspect for Netflix. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's great. No, yeah, these are all I'm these are all million dollars more than many million dollars ideas that you have. So, you know, I, I would appreciate any of these. <laughs> in, in, unless it's a billion dollars in a network. Uh, What's the point? What's the point? Yeah, you're right. It's you. It's not enough to have a unicorn. You have to have a herd of unicorns. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, you're gonna have a stable. That's uh... <laughs> exactly. exactly exactly right. Um. So we have actually we have quite a few questions on Vix. Please share. Yeah. So ah okay. Um, this one is again from the audience it says what might be some unintended consequences and what concerns should we have on this subject okay so i think there's probably if i can interpret speaking about recommendation engines generally so i guess yeah some unintended oh, consequences mm -hmm. it, I, I appreciate that that question because actually one of the books i was looking to do with mit press mm -hmm. my background my serious academic background yeah. Um, I have people aren't laughing when, when I use that phrase, it's in economics and computer science. <clears throat> and the original essential knowledge book I was going to work on, and I did a draft of, of a couple of chapters, mm -hmm. was on perverse incentives. Ah. So take unintended consequences very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And the book drifted away because I felt I should do something on incentives rather than perverse incentives. And the whole thing got away from me. Yeah. You know, it, the book got away from me and I recommendation engine struck me as a, a better focus, a, yeah. a better coherence. Yeah. But I've paid a lot of attention to unintended consequences. It's, it's very clear. Yeah. You know, addiction yeah. may be an unintended consequence. Here we're talking, I, here I am, I'm the champion of mindfulness and empowerment. Mm -hmm. But around TikTok and YouTube right. and Spotify and yeah. Facebook, yeah. we can imagine addiction and dependence. Eli Parasarik came up with a wonderful phrase, the filter bubble, that okay. you, you end up just being exposed to things that you like because the recommendation engine is just rewarded for giving you what it is it thinks that you want. Right. Um, I do want to point out there is a difference between long-term unintended consequences and short-term. Okay. And, you know, if, if I'm trying to optimize a transaction, that's different than trying to optimize customer lifetime value. Right. Sure. The, other, the other kind of thing is qui bono, who benefits? Yeah. 
The unintended consequences is if I, should I really, it's like my friend, mm -hmm. single quote, should I really trust my friend mm -hmm. or let's put it in a work phrase, mm -hmm. my boss, okay? okay. Let's, let's, let's take a real world situation and I apologize for, for this example in advance. But there are some organizations that provide mental health and wellness counseling for their employees. But the counselor is an employee of the company. And so I'm not feeling well. Da, da. So the, the loyalty, yeah. the ethical protection is given to the employer, not the employee who's being counseled. Right, right. Well, recommendation engines are, can be the same thing. If the, if, what is the teleology? What is the purpose mm -hmm. of the recommendation engine? Is it to you know, shear you like a sheep? Yeah. You know, is it to milk you like a cow? Is it to yeah. maximize value extraction from you? Or is, what are the, what are the, you know, this is, we mentioned nudge earlier. Yeah. Well, uh, Thaler and Sunstein have another word, sludge. These are the choice architectures that admire you, that, that cover you, forgive my using this language, that cover you in shit. Yeah. Well, of course it's called fertilizer, but we all know what it really is, it's shit. Uh -huh. you know? And and that's one of the reasons, just to make it slightly meaningful yeah. uh, extension on this question. The best way of confronting the perverse outcomes, perverse consequences, is let's insist on, you know, I talked about tunability, uh -huh. let's insist on greater transparency yeah. around the recommendation engines. Yeah. What are two of the biggest issues yeah. of machine learning going forward? Mm -hmm. Everybody on this call knows it. Explainability, interpretability. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest and largest utilization of machine learning today is in recommendation engines. Mm -hmm. Let's make that TikTok algorithm and the data sets driving it more transparent, more interpretable, more explainable. Let's do it for Spotify. Let's do it for Netflix. Let's do it for Amazon. Let's do it for LinkedIn. Because that's the best and surest way of at least ameliorating or mitigating or anticipating what, what are sure to be unintended and unhappy consequences. Right, right. right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that that transparency certainly is missing. And I could be mistaken, but I think even for those uh, who are the data scientists and the software engineers who are building the engines, sometimes I don't know that they know. You know, they don't. <laughs> they, that, 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 this is this is really one of the hot areas. That's why yeah. the you know the OpenAI Foundation. Yeah. You know, yeah. all, you know how, how does deep learning work? Nobody quote unquote really knows on these yeah. things. But that's why this is such, in my opinion, why it's such an exciting area, and we're going to have to decide. How much are, of the indifference curve, back to economics, are we going to be able to build between efficacy mm -hmm. of recommendation and transparency, right. accessibility, understandability, and interpretability right. of, of recommendation engines and the, the deep learning that, that underlies that? Right. Again, these are they're already huge issues. And I think it's one of the reasons why China doesn't want to make TikTok too transparent, because TikTok has, by any definition you wish to apply, one of the most successful and effective recommendation systems in the history of the world. Yeah. I would think that even Jeff Bezos and the Amazon team is a little bit envious <laughs> of what, what TikTok can do, you know, what the Beijing yeah. Dance folks can do. Yeah, at this point, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's right, is like the trade-off there, or maybe it's not a true trade-off, but they are, I think, uh, going back to your point, optimizing maybe for the efficacy portion. Um, or Absolutely. The, yeah. Absolutely. By the way, this is the key issue yeah. in medicine. What's one of the most important ethical issues? Informed consent. Yeah. Can you really have informed consent without transparency? Can you really have informed consent without interpretability? Right. These are these are not futuristic issues. These are issues that healthcare systems worldwide and in America in particular, they're dealing with now. How does that drug work? Right. Why are there these uh, uh, negative effects? Yeah. yeah. We yeah. want transparency and visibility into that. Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, definitely that hits home for me because, you know, as we mentioned, my uh, currently work in healthcare and informed consent is always uh, an interesting and thorny issue. I will leave it at that. <laughs> but, uh, okay. Um, oh, more questions. Okay. So, uh, interesting. Oh, you know, we, we've been delving deep into like the, the ethics and sort of, I would say going beyond the tech of recommendation engines. And this one right. really is interesting on that point. Um, the question is, should recommendation engines be available to law enforcement, public health and safety authorities to identify individuals likely to harm others? interesting question well there was a movie based on that called minority report yeah. yes and yes instead of recommendation awesome. engines they had zombies in yeah. in, in uh, a, a amniotic fluid yeah, or yeah. let me be very blunt these things already exist uh -huh. they already exist uh -huh. you know the new york back when when and i'm i don't mean to sound political saying this but back when new york took crime seriously you know uh the new york police department helped pioneer what was called comp stamp, oh yes which yeah. was a statistics it was originally you know let's all together now descriptive yeah. to, to statistics that ultimately became predictive right. and prescriptive statistics gee we're seeing these kinds of activities in these neighborhoods where should we be staging the cars yeah. should it be a, 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 a labeled car to be a form of deterrence or should it be a you know a unmarked car so that we can actually get further insight into what looks to be nefarious activity yeah so these things already exist the uk already has quote unquote a nudge unit that that looks to incorporate nudges and in things like getting people to pay their taxes mm -hmm. To, to take public health measures. Yeah. Uh, we see this in pension. We see all manner of things where the notion of recommendation is linked to actually evoke action, not just to inform choice. Mm -hmm. So this is actually, I wanna deal with this explicitly because this question raises this point. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between informing public policy with better recommendation and linking that information with choices that people make or have to make, that the cops need to do this, that the contact tracers, we recommend you do this. Mm -hmm. So now, mind you, I believe that everybody should honor the law and respect the law, but the, the hidden aspect of that question is innovative recommendation creates ethical issues okay everybody knows that somebody who's been getting really good advice not to do something and they're doing it anyway okay so so uh, here's the ethical question i've asked it's a medical question and i this is a question that has haunted me i sell give advice i i am a human recommendation engine mm -hmm. even when i'm well paid Mm -hmm. If I have a client who just does not follow, isn't the right word, go along and get or act upon my recommendations, is it ethical for me to keep taking money from them? Mm -hmm. Should a doctor mm -hmm. resign a patient yeah. who simply is not following any of their advice? Because, because maybe the, that patient will follow the advice of another doctor, you know, another servant. So you cannot escape the same ethical questions surrounding human beings actually become more data-driven in a recommendation engine environment. So the, you cannot escape yeah. the ethical implications and the ethical futures here. So, you know, when is it okay to prevent a crime? Five minutes before, five seconds before, the day before. Yeah. How should I do so? Should I send a passive note or should I make an active presence? Okay, you know, serious example. We can project domestic abuse kind of situations, okay? Out of 100, we know what the distribution is going to be. 
should social workers proactively, preemptively reach out to spouse, both spouses and say, everything okay, right. as a signal. Right. What an interesting public policy experiment that is. Don't attribute that one to me. Okay, okay? got it. But, but is that an unrealistic, you know the statistics, is that an unrealistic public health initiative? Not at all, yeah. not at all. It's definitely, uh, it actually ties really well into um, another question that came in from the audience, which is, you know, I, I think a lot of us ask this every day, which is around the mounting privacy issues. Yes. As more and more of the data is stored online. And especially, you know, working in healthcare, privacy has always been sort of at the forefront, but maybe not so for other industries. And uh, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on sort of how to, how to merge those worlds? <laughs> um, that is a great question. And, you know, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up on the most logical way, which is what do we, it, to me, the issue is not just privacy mm -hmm. or even control of data. It's trust. Okay. It's trust. Yeah. There are some private organizations I trust more than the government. And there are some governmental organizations I trust more than private entities. And, um, you know, do, who do I trust with a nudge? When does it, you know, it's called nudge, not shove. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. So, so um, I, I really, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a shout out to my friend, Chris Dolan, who is in no small part responsible for, for the invitation here. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity. But I think with things like blockchain, I think that the ability to build in accountability to deter abuse, mm -hmm. because it's not just the violation, it's the abuse associated with that. If I feel that somebody or some algorithm is looking out for my best interest, I'll forgive a lot. Okay. If I feel that you're using that information asymmetry to exploit me, mm -hmm. I will come after you, hammer, tongs, and lawyers. <laughs> Can't forget the lawyers. So yeah. never forget the lawyers. Never forget the lawyers. I and and they're the best lawyers are also recommendation engines. But that's a conversation for another time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think actually, yeah, we are um, at the end of our time. Actually, or almost. And so I just want to say this has been amazing. Thank you so oh, much. For, yeah. It's been great fun. It's been. Yeah almost as much fun as our first conversation and <laughs> for the people. you know feel free i just want to make it clear uh, yeah we're all a part of the mit community it's schrag at mit.edu if people okay. have questions or issues Perfect. if you have a copy of the book you'd like to send and have me sign happy to do it okay. you know but i'm 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 really grateful for the opportunity here and it's been a, it's been great fun Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your time and, and recommendation engines out now. Um, thank you so much. And I may send mine for you to sign. That would be awesome. <laughs> you, are, you, you, are, you are too kind. I'll put it, I'll make sure there's a heart. In oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sonny. And, and, and best to play. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Thank